Hello, insiders. Welcome to this new episode of the EU Bubble Insider Podcast. Our today's guest is Stefan Bost, until recently CEO of the Edelman Brussels office and now head of energy and industrials at Edelman, responsible for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Stefan, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Christoph, for having me. Stefan, um, you've been around Brussels quite long um, and I wanted to kick off this interview with uh, the question about the journey that has brought you here. A journey and maybe you could give us an insight about the turning points that influenced uh, your career path uh, to where you are now. Oh, that's uh, indeed a long journey. Um, I arrived in Brussels in, I think it was October 2005. My, my son was barely a year old. And at that time, I was still working as a journalist and uh, focusing mainly on industry topics, but then also more and more as policy influences industry on on the effects of EU legislation on, on, on business decisions. Uh, so my editor-in-chief thought it a good idea to send me to Brussels to get some first-hand experience. And I stayed there. It was back then for the weekly German weekly focus magazine. Stayed there as a correspondent for five years. And then it was the time when, let's say, a younger generation was not so interested in printed media anymore. Um, media landscape has changed massively. The, the whole industry has gone through a transformation. Hence, we are here in, in a podcast now. Um, and uh, that was a decision where I basically, I had seen quite a lot of things in the European theater, uh, so to say. So the interests of different governments and, and states who historically have been at war with each other very much and found through the EU a way of creating a better future together, despite all the differences and despite all the problems that still still exist. And I was so fascinated that I didn't want to leave. There was an opportunity for me to go back, but I didn't want to. So I decided to, I always had a, a touch of an entrepreneur in me. So I decided to start my own consultancy uh, back then, my focus was because there were a lot of very good regulatory affairs people and there were not so many people who understood the impact of good communications on, on campaigns, on public affairs campaigns. And I, I saw an opportunity there. So I started my own company, did that, grew that for uh, a decade. And then uh, as so many entrepreneurs do at some point, I sold the company and uh, then I received the opportunity to, to work for Edelman, um, which is the biggest PR company on the globe, privately held, and uh, lead the office ever since. And if you ask me about turning points, it was always the reassessment of how important Europe really is still. Is it, does it still matter? And I think it matters more these days than, than ever before. I couldn't agree more. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast uh, to to get access to, to insights about how Europe actually works. Mm, but you, you, you said it right that so much has changed uh, since you started. Um, to someone who would uh, be inspired by your career and would like to follow some of your steps, uh, but in today's world, um, what advice would you give? Because the world um, 10 years from now, even five years from now, was very different in terms of the yeah. skills needed. And uh, maybe from also the point of, of, of Edelman, Brussels CEO, what people you look for uh, in, in, in uh, your uh, recruitment. Yeah. So the skills that that are needed haven't changed so much through the course of the digitization. Of course, we have different tools available these days. So a lot of things are more transparent. You can get easier access to documents these days. Um, 
but there also is a lot more content. So, so sorting through it and understanding it and understanding the implications still is very important. The, the key capacities a good public affairs practitioner should have is to speak and write clearly. That is still very much on top of everything because no matter how well you understand something, if you're not able to express your thoughts properly and if you're not being understood, uh, you will end up nowhere. I put a very high value on interpersonal skills, being able to to create a connection, uh, as digital as this world may be, the decisions are still taken by human beings. So you need to be able to connect the, to them, to establish a level of report and trust, um, because otherwise your well-written message, if you have the first skill, will also not be heard because nobody will pick it up and uh, trust it that it's valid. There is a third part that is very important and that is even more important than in the past. So public affairs in the past often has been about personal relationships and, and being able to connect people. That still is important, but to really understand the technicalities of the process and the inflection points where you have a higher level of potential influence, of, of ability to put positions forward, um, that is very important especially outside, I'm a, I'm a trained lawyer. Um, so there is a legal process that, that is very clear and transparent. It's written down in the law. But surrounding this legal process is a, a whole universe of, of underlying processes. And a good public affairs practitioner should understand these uh, very much as well. And the last skill maybe is to understand that all of the different practices, communications, regulatory affairs, public affairs, governmental relations, are moving closer and closer together. Um, they're influencing each other more and more, and you need to understand these dynamics. A good comms campaign can stop a public affairs effort. Uh, NGOs demonstrate that every other day. Um, the most elaborate public affairs campaign can can fall on deaf ears if you get the timing wrong. Um, so it really depends on understanding all the, the different aspects of this puzzle. And uh, that is something people should, it takes a while to get there, it takes experience. But uh, once you get there, this will make you quite exceptional. So you don't believe AI will take the jobs? Of <laughs> take over people. the world? <laughs> or take over the world? I, I, I used to program in my very young years. That was way before the internet was there. So I'm, I'm, I'm of that, I remember those times. Uh, I'm of that generation. Um, and the large language models we see today uh, actually have their roots back then. I, I did some programming on parsers, which were for text adventures at the day, also trying to understand languages. Um, now this is this is a predictive language model where basically the the algorithm pieces together the most uh, relevant words in in a, a fashion that makes sense. I think we're a long way from AI that can replace humans a long way. Um, we are on the verge of having tools at our disposal that will make us more efficient quite soon. I, I, I literally, that uh, ChatGBT, for example, or other AI models, I mean, now Google has put forward BARD and, and Microsoft has put forward its own on ChatGBT uh, kind of offer. So we will see more and more of these offerings and they will get better and better. Um, they will speed up the process. They, they will speed up our way of communicating and our, our, our ability to react fast to things because the, the basic draft can be done by AI. Um, then it takes a human being to put it into the proper shape and, and make sure it doesn't go off the rails. Uh, that's still necessary. But uh, let's say in terms of, I, I tested ChatGPT, in terms of concise writing, it is very capable. 
it is able to distill, uh, for example, notes into a very concise list of bullet points. And that's really helpful. That saves you at least 15, half an hour of time. So that's good. And I think the best way to see it is just another step forward in making our work more efficient. Um, last uh, episode was uh, with uh, Richard Pavlik from the European Parliament, uh, and he was telling me how when he started working at the European Parliament, uh, everything was digital. So to get uh, a committee to agree on something, you had to actually run around offices and get physical signatures, and it took it, it could take you hours. Uh, now it's all done on, on, on laptops or, or, or tablets of, of MEPs. And uh, this, like you said, it's it, it, the, the AI we just got should be maybe treated as a very cheap, sometimes free, if you use the, the new Microsoft thing, it's for free. Uh, there is the paid version of ChatGPT, um, but still very cheap assistant that uh, you get uh, to to do some of the work for you make it faster but it will not replace you i also agree with that mm. now i have uh, one topic that i wanted to ask it's maybe a topic that everyone is tired uh, talking about uh, because i will use the word pandemic uh, but we will not discuss the pandemic i wanted to um, ask you about the long-term impact because organizations, big and small companies have learned a lot about new ways of working, working remotely. Um, some say it's the new uh, must have. Some say it's not that much efficient uh, in the long term because it doesn't allow us to build the relationships uh, that we need as humans. Um, maybe hybrid work is the solution. So exactly. Um, has what are the long-term effects uh, for for uh, for you and your team um, in how it changed the way you work with maybe also with clients? It it did change the way we work um, in a good and in a bad way. Um, so the positive side, the upside of it, is um, we give, especially to our younger staff more opportunity to, in this hybrid world, find a be better balance between being at the office and getting the stuff at home done. I mean, every one of us has, has to find that balance to a certain degree, but it makes it infinitely easier if you're able to work from home at least for a set of days. I'm personally not a believer in full virtualization. I think personal connection is in the end more efficient. Uh, it is faster. It is also, you don't learn that easy on on team calls. So you, you need a person to talk to, to share your thoughts with, or who shares his or her thoughts with you. So that it is important to have that physical reality as well. Um, so for example, at Edelman, we decided to go by a, a, a two flexible days where you can work from home. You don't have to, but you can choose to do so. Um, it's about getting the balance right. The second part in in the bad way, <coughs> that is really something I, I, I don't like so much. Let's take, for example, partly the European Commission. Um, it is so much easier to avoid contact with the outside world. It is you just refer to... You, you you keep that at a distance and but that also decouples you from insights and information that you may need for good decision making and if you only do your your research by questionnaires and uh, i personally uh, as a former journalist i of course believe that um you always need to talk to people you really need to talk to them, ideally in person, because only then you will get a deeper understanding of where they are really coming from. And uh, that cannot be hybrid. As, as I said before, as long as our decisions are made by human beings, it, personal connection will matter. 
and your ability to, to have those connections on a meaningf meaningful basis will matter quite a lot. Um, so that I see a certain reluctance, uh, especially in the younger generation at this point in time to they are very naturally, and that's not, not something I blame them for. It's really something that has to do with the kind of upbringing plus the pandemic, plus the different uh, education they have received. There is a reluctance of um, reaching out to people, giving them a call instead of writing an email. Writing an email is, is easy, so you don't have to face any immediate reaction. Um, but it's much better to have a call, to have a meeting, to sit down, and connect and that is a bit the downside we, we need to reinstill the happiness to to meet people it is a big challenge um for for the public affairs industry uh for sure um so so could you um do you, have you figured out any way to to overcome this to actually address this and get people to meet with you uh <laughs> Let's say those people from... I, I, from... I'm just very insistent. <laughs> and then I try to make the, the meeting nice and, and hopefully helpful. And, and I always say when you meet someone, you better bring something to the table so they don't feel their time is wasted. You are taking away valuable time of their day. So you should have something to offer that can be an interesting thought, that can be a position paper that really is not... Uh, that depends on the circumstance. But... Um, Making meaning, meetings meaningful is, is, in my mind, the, the magic. And uh, I, I think we haven't come to a full solution. I just try to inspire people to do it because it, meeting people is fun. Connecting with people is generally fun. It gives you something positive in your life. Even if a meeting is complicated, you may learn something out of it. And that's also a benefit. So I I can only encourage people to to connect more. My observation over the last couple of months was that people were so excited to go back to the normal uh, way of meeting. Um, of course, not everyone, but 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 uh, there were so many events and conferences organized in Brussels that sometimes I had the impression people are getting even overbooked. Um, I saw a couple events uh, cancelled that would have normally not been cancelled. Uh, do, do you share this observation? Yeah, it was, of course, after COVID subsided. Um, I mean, it's still with us, but luckily the, the hard effects have subsided. Uh, there was a certain eagerness to get back into the game. That's true. Um, I find it it's a very different way of, of meetings. When I arrived in Brussels, a lot of the events were really, they, they, they struck a good balance between being fun and informative, and it was not so formal. Ever since uh, the pandemic, I have the feeling the meetings uh, have have more of a formal note and, and are, and indeed they compete for very few days in the week. I mean, that, that that's the reality of this this traveling circus with Strasbourg and everything. Um, so you only get a couple of days where it really makes sense to have an event. And these days are quite overbooked. And then there is a certain reluctance um, of some people now to show up as speakers without calling out any names. But yeah. uh, getting good speakers is a bit harder than it used to be. So it seems that we live in this overactive world of, you know, work mixing with home. That that's one takeaway from the pandemic. Now in the PR com comes work. You have to work in different industries. Of course, everyone has their specializations, but comms people have to be able to jump from energy to chemicals to medicine uh, automotives uh, and then beauty for 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 another opportunity um and this is i think one of the 
<clears throat> most important questions to ask to to someone that is uh, so experienced uh, as you are how do you stay informed how do you stay on top of things how do you manage the 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 the, the load of information mm-hmm. without using ai uh, i suppose to filter out uh, or maybe you do to filter out what's really important um, what what is your advice on that well uh let's say the information filtering becomes easier with experience because you know what matters and what you can safely ignore or for a time ignore or push back to a later time. Uh, There are things that you just need to be monitoring, quite frankly. That is what the EU Commission is doing, that it was to a certain degree what the Parliament is doing and what the member states are doing in the council. Uh, and I mean, the, this is the, the triangle of institutions that you need to monitor closely. There are a myriad of tools out there to do so. Of course, political is something you have to, to monitor as well. But then there are, let's say, mechanisms uh, where you understand the process well, and it doesn't really matter which industry you're operating in, because the underlying process of of lawmaking is pretty much the same. It's there are different actors, there are different players, you need to be aware of those. So basically, you filter through what is happening at the legislative level, you interpret it for the different sectors or companies or clients that you're working for. And then you decide, okay, what is super urgent? Where do I need to act quickly? What can should be monitored but doesn't require immediate action and what basically can go down that uh, probably the the uh, i will look at this again half a year later line of things so that's that's that the other thing is uh connect very well with with your network um i i get a lot of hints, suggestions, ideas, and and information out of the people that I know in Brussels. And it is completely normal. Sometimes sometimes people think they get overwhelmed because they don't see everything happening. And that's quite natural. Um, You will never see everything that's happening in Brussels. Um, But using, it's not AI, but using intelligence um, human intelligence actually is quite helpful because if you're talking to one human being, let's say an expert in the energy sector, he or she will have done a lot of the research and monitoring for you. So they will inform you about you should be aware of this, you should be aware of that, and you should probably do something here. And these people, if you have established a good relationship, are happy to share that information because you're giving something back to them because you come out so, uh, from outside of their expertise bubble and they benefit from, from what you experience in other ways. It's always a give and take in Brussels as far as I've experienced this place so far. And they uh, will also provide you with the right context of the information. Yes, exactly. So th- this this is exactly it. That's why human connection is so tremendously important because they really have intelligence. They're not artificial uh, and they will have done a lot of the work for you beforehand. I like very much your advice about the art of ignorance from the beginning of this answer. Uh, Could you elaborate more how to learn that? Oh, um, I, I really think, I genuinely think it comes with experience. It takes years. I, I always, I advise clients to not exchange their Brussels staff too fast because it takes, even for a very smart person, two to three years to really get the place in the basics. That's not, that's not understanding everything, but to get the basics really right, it takes a while. And a lot of companies send back their their people who have just come to the point of understanding. Just figured it out. <clears throat> they send it back. That has a positive effect as well because the knowledge travels inside the company. And if the company is smart, they will put these people in places where they can utilize what they know. Um, but also in a crucially important place like Brussels, 
you should have people that are of very high quality of the traits that we talked about earlier and allow them to, to profess their expertise there. There may be a time when they're in Brussels too long. That can also happen. Uh, then you need to rotate. But um, let's say under three years really doesn't make that much sense unless it's just for training them on what is going on in the EU. So, Stefan, uh, it seems that Brussels is this place where, uh, you said it a couple of times already, meeting people and, and establishing personal connections is so important. And that cannot be done without being here long enough because you have to build trust, which Edelman actually specializes in, and we will get to that in a moment. So I wanted to ask you um, how that influences the way you have to build communication strategy, have to think about campaigns. Uh, if the process that you that your clients face in Brussels takes quite long, uh, you probably really construct campaigns that take a couple of months because not much can be achieved in a couple of months in, 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 in Brussels, right? Um, the campaign design, if it's, let's put it this way, let's dissect this. So in an ideal world, uh, which rarely is the case, but in an ideal world, you will look at the process. You would identify the critical points where you need to put forward position papers, where you need to do public campaigning, where you need to do maybe some some more detailed stuff. <clears throat> Sorry. And then you would carry out the strategy, which will encompass a comms part, a public affairs part, regulatory affairs part, maybe something legal even uh, to some degree. So in an ideal world, you would have that overarching strategy and you would find someone who is willing to carry that out. This is very, very rare very rare. Usually, it, this is too long term for most budgets. This is too long term for most clients. Um, clients want to see, of course, a, a certain return on invest, and, and that is just natural. So what, what usually happens is that uh, you look at the campaigns from a perspective of the inflection point itself. So you design it for that moment to get some feedback, some opinion change. I mean, in the end, that is what you want to do. You want to sway people's minds. And that is that is uh, where trust comes in. You can sway people's minds much easier if they actually trust your message. So if you're, if you're someone saying that you want to behave well and then you campaign for that and then you do not follow up with action, people will actually increase their distrust in you. So that this will not help you. And that is that is the core of everything that we research uh, in the trust space, and we've been doing that for 23 years now, is that action is the critical element. Action drives trust. You need to walk the talk. And th that is something that also also the constituencies, the voters see more and more. And that's why they get so disenfranchised with a lot of the politicians, because there are a lot of promises being made in order to get elected. And in the past, it was it was usually quite easy to get away if you don't live up to them. But that has become so prevalent now that people get disenfranchised. And then they say, OK, if my vote is not important and I vote for something else, something maybe more radical. Um, so I think it is crucially important, uh, and that is also one of the findings in our trust barometer, that business does not fall into the same bracket and really does or acts upon the promises they make. And that will drive trust levels up. That will make your communications and your campaigning more effective um, because people will believe you. And when they believe you, they are much more likely to change their mind. And um, so trust is, for me, still at, at the core of everything that we do. So how do you, if you meet a new client, how do you convince them that 
trust is one of the most important, if not the most important thing to focus on? Well, usually when they come to Edelman, they know that we research and look at trust. So they usually have a high understanding of the value of trust already. A lot of the clients that we work for are global clients. So we, we basically just work for them in Brussels and they are global clients also based on the reality that they know we understand the trust mechanics quite well. Uh, if somebody approaches us um, with with no knowledge or little knowledge about it, I mean, we have all the data and statistics to basically show them the impact and, 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 and show the need for, for tr building trusted relationships. Um, it has the effect there are still actors out there, let's say, in, in, in this whole uh, environment that we have, who like to utilize mechanics that are not trust-based, and we, we don't pick up those. So if, if, if the thing that that someone wants to do is not in line with our values and not in line with the, the, the values that we represent as a company, then this is the pleasure of, of uh, being the largest global PR and communications company that we can say no, and we do occasionally. I would agree that this is one of the most important things in actually running an agency business is to learning and it's not easy learning how to differentiate which clients you actually take on and which you do not and for what reasons and there are many ways to to to, to approach that but figuring this out for me personally was one of the turning points let's mm. say in my career so except this um walking the talk which seems quite obvious if you promise something you should deliver but as you say it wasn't always uh, the case w what are the other challenges uh, in, in in managing trust uh, for brands or, or organizations the there are the two main challenges the one is you've come from a space where trust did not matter so much for whatever reason, uh, which can happen if you're in a particular industry that has very little uh, to do with the general public. So let's say you're coming from the B2B space and, and uh, public trust is not so important for you. But that game has changed because there is no pure B2B business anymore. There always is an impact on or public scrutiny of some sorts. There are, are societal goals that are increasingly important and monitored even by investors, <clears throat> sorry, uh, uh, to make investment decisions. So, so you need to be able to connect to the general public, even if your business uh, is not really directed towards them. But public sentiment and, and uh, your, you living up to your, your ESG commitments uh, is actually quite crucial. The second part is companies that come from a historically distrusted sector. And uh, in, in I, I, for example, I worked for the chemicals industry quite intensively for over a decade. And I've seen the change, how long it took the industry to regain trust. First, there were a lot of incidents. We haven't seen any chemical incident of any significance for a very long time. People find it hard to remember that by now. So the industry has profoundly changed the way it operates uh, for the better. There's not as much recognition for it as you would wish for, but but it has committed to that change. Um, secondly, now we see a similar development in the energy space where, where different sectors, all kinds of sectors, are really committing to becoming carbon neutral, really committing to becoming energy efficient, which is also business imperative because energy is quite expensive these days, and really committing to change. And that includes companies that probably don't have the best trust environment in the general public. For them, it is, it is the challenge to convince the public that the change is happening and that 
the action is happening. So they need to communicate that transition in a way that the public and voters in the end give them the time and the license to operate to get this transition done properly. And that really is, is sometimes a challenge when you come from a, a sector that has a certain level of distrust. Take take the automotive sector, for example, with the, the scandal regarding the emissions. That has, that has limited, even in Germany, which largely depends on the automotive sector for its economic uh, prosperity, still people were so angry about this that that the companies had a very hard time finding support even though they they are the source of a lot of growth and jobs and development and and innovation but this one incident destroyed the trust to a level where the whole industry suddenly is in in under public scrutiny whether you've you've done something or not that is even worse that some of the companies haven't done anything but they're caught up in this in this distrust cycle and that that's not helpful and then we have and in our measurement we see very clearly that the most distrusted entities are are uh, the media and and politics unfortunately and i think there it is also very important that that uh, Trust is re-established. Trust in the media is crucially important. Having been a journalist, I, I strongly believe that the media has a role to play in a healthy society, but that means it cannot make itself party. It needs to be an independent observer that does not make itself part of any mission, as good, good and positive as it may be. It needs to stay a little bit at a distance. And politics... Yeah, well, there we we see that the lure of, let's say, populism and um, quick votes is very strong. We see it in in Hungary. We see it in in, in we, we saw that the more extremist movements in uh, several European countries, and that's not helpful. We need to find the middle ground. A common ground. We have European values to defend, and we need to re-establish a level of trust that that carries this. But working with journalists, not media outlets, journalists, and observing uh, how the space evolves, would you agree that the trust has actually shifted from media brands, media outlets, to specific journalists? And it's this, the specific people that we want to trust, not some uh, newspaper or magazine, uh, online magazine brand. Mm -hmm. um, there is a tendency for that. So we see this individual journalist um, media ventures out there. Um, uh, in Germany, we have Gabor Steingart's uh, publication, um, which is quite well received. Uh, we have similar things popping up, newsletters by people, um, blogs, etc. Um, I don't think it's particularly good. There always were star journalists. I mean, uh, but they usually were embedded in an editorial environment of a great paper. Um, and I think that also helps to ground them to a certain degree, I think if you're too too solo, then then you start losing a certain ability to to see things in a from a different way, different perspective. Um, I I think the big media brands have an opportunity. They have an opportunity to regain trust, to to regain, and I, I see it in Germany happening partly. The some of the the Publications that have made changes are are they stop the downturn to a degree, and I hope this trend will continue. We need we need healthy media, and we don't only need the individual people running the show because that can very quickly get yeah let's say not so helpful. I want to ask one more question about specifically. Uh, the way Edelman does things, uh, 
it's a great opportunity to learn from you today. So uh, would you be able to share um, an example of, of a particularly challenging um, campaign, maybe without mentioning the brand um, behind it? Um, we have and, a lot and, of confidentiality <laughs> agreements. So. No, but I, I, I can make it very general. Um, so we are in Brussels, of course, mainly focused on public affairs, but we understand the communications aspect of public affairs very, very well. So we have the, the procedural knowledge and we have the comms knowledge and we have the tools to actually bring those two together. Um, these days, of course, you always add a digital component on top of it uh, because all of the things also need to have a digital aspect. What I think we are particularly good at is looking at where does a certain issue stand? Who are the audiences that can influence the decision? Because that is often an, a misunderstood. A, a lot of clients just want to meet the commissioner or someone, someone like that. And this is something we usually try to, to limit to a, a manageable degree, especially these days. It, it can be a nice photo op, but not necessarily exactly. an efficient it's meeting. A, it's a nice photo op, but usually you have a lot more impact if you do proper work, if you understand the process, if you understand up to the, the aspects. You need to get your data right. We help, we help clients with, of course, sorting out their information they can bring to the table. There we are. So we make sure they can bring something to the table. We, we make sure they understand what they need to change which sometimes is something different from what they want to change and, and how to get there and who are the people to really sway an opinion, which are usually, it's not such a big group of people. If you analyze it well, if you look at the, the voting behaviors in the parliament, if you look at the decision-making processes in, in secondary le uh, legislation, um, there are, that's not a big group of people. And then you need to come up with a strategy how to sway minds and how to sway opinions. And uh, that's where I would say we excel at. I think that this, uh, this is great advice because people often forget that good communications, good campaigning doesn't have to be loud campaigning. Uh, and you know, it's trivial, it sounds trivial, but uh, you don't have to always be uh, allowed to, to achieve your goals. Mm, I, I wanted to finish with a question about, uh, because we spoke a lot about how work has changed, um, how um, the pandemic has influenced um, the industry um, in Brussels. So let me finish with a question about your team and how you manage your mm -hmm. your team and actually the question is how do you make sure your people are happy at the work they do <laughs> well first and foremost uh i talk to them <laughs> and i try to again <laughs> I, I i again i i try to understand what what is important for them we have of course tools and mechanics uh to make sure that we were just conducting a huge survey globally uh, uh, about what people think. It's fully anom uh, anonymized. We will go into, into deep, deep, deep thinking about the outcome. And we, we do actually, we had a similar survey when I, when I took up the job uh, at Edelman. We have this once a year. And uh, out of all of the findings that, that my team, where they said, okay, we want to change something, uh, we've changed most of those, so we adapted. And again, action, action drives trust. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, that is now I, I tell that to the team as well. If something is really bothering you, you need to speak up. Uh, we, in the agency world, you live in a very high-paced environment, and it's it's sometimes tough especially if you have uh, people with young families or little kids. Of course, that's not always easy. And uh, we, we try to make it manageable, but certainly it's not a stress-free environment and it will never be. But 
On the other hand, and there we come to something that you said earlier, um, it is also a very interesting job because you get to see different sectors. You get to see a multitude of clients, of issues, of things. You learn a lot about the world and about industries. And uh, some people, for example, me, and I've been in the agency world now for quite a while, this is very appealing. You, This is actually the most appealing part. It justifies the stressful times that, that never happen, gets boring that just happened. Stefan, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time uh, and all this very valuable insights. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Please make sure to follow the EU Bubble Insider um, and stay updated with our newsletter uh, so you get notified about the future episode. Stefan, thank you very much. It thank was a pleasure can. to have you with us today. Have a very good day, very good week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.